Welcome to the Lazy Geeks Podcast, a podcast that takes a look at pop culture, technology, social media, politics, or whatever I choose to cover, and tells you why you can't believe everything you read online or hear about on TikTok. Welcome back, internet people. Yes, the Lazy Geeks are back, but just one of us. I know we ended the show almost a year ago and moved on to another show. However, that show ended earlier this year and we haven't recorded anything together since. Now that isn't to say that we won't do another episode together or maybe even a new one. Just for right now, it doesn't appear to be in the cards for us at, you know, at least anytime soon. So the blog and the show are back, as is the away team. All our past episodes of both that show and this show are available are still available for all of you to listen to all 400 plus episodes of this show and uh i think a uh, hundred and something of the last one not exactly sure but in regards to this conception or at least the new conception of this show i will be dealing with three news items of the past week and a main topic kind of similar to what we had before but hopefully i can come up with a main topic each week and Now, it may not be very timely, but that's what the news stories are for. Our social media platforms are back, except for Twitter. We're not, we're we're, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. Our engagement rate took a toilet hit after Elon took over. And however, we are on threads, so you can catch us there. Also, I'm putting these episodes on our YouTube channel. Open up our listener base a little bit. See what happens. I mean, you're not going to see me, but you're going to be listening to me with maybe a colorful picture in front of you. So with all that out of the way, let's get this going. On to the news. Someone online came up with a conspiracy theory of their own. They claim that inflation seemed to be to come along just when the great resignation took a hold, a way of reminding employees that you have no rights. Their job is to work for big corporations. Now I kind of buy it. So many things keep going up and we're not, we're getting a whole lot less for our money. So case in point, Apple is the latest company to increase prices on their subscription services, Apple TV, Arcade, and News Plus. Increases went up in factors of three. Apple TV increased from $6.99 to $9.99, to be honest. Uh, it's one of the cheaper ones out there. I mean... Freaking Netflix took a, what's now 20 bucks just for one. Good God. And, and Apple TV actually has some pretty good content and a lot of movies are coming out this year with under the Apple studio. So, you know, they're going to be coming to Apple plus. So, you know, it's a good, good way to get in it on that. Apple arcade and Apple news plus had their first increase since their launch in 2019. It doesn't make the increase any better though. Arcade went up from $4.99 to $6.99, while News Plus increased from $9.99 to $12.99. Their Apple One bundle increased from $16.95 to $19.95, which is still cheaper than paying for the services individually, but still. Apple One Family now runs you $25.95 a month, while Premiere will run you $37.95 a month. God damn. On the annual front, Apple TV went from 69 per year to 99 per year. As is, as of this recording, iCloud, Apple Music, and Fitness Plus will remain unchanged. Apple ex- explained this in their press release. The subscription prices of Apple TV, Apple Arcade, and Apple News Plus, and Apple One will increase in the U.S. and select international markets start beginning today. Existing subscribers will see these price increases 30 days later on their next renew date. We are focused on delivering the best experience possible for our customers by consistently adding high-quality entertainment, content, and innovative features to our services. So... As 
I read before, the increases will hit consumers in the United States, the United Kingdom, and parts of Europe. The price change will impact new customers right now. Current subscribers will have to wait 30 days on their, their first renewal time after that. So you get kind of a month reprieve. Um, to be honest, I'm not surprised. They're increasing once one does it, everybody else does it. And the biggest problem is, is that we kind of let it happen. Now, you got to remember it's supply and demand. You know, if their services aren't in as much demand, either one, they're going to reduce their prices or start offering you hell of a good deal on on their current slate. Last year, I got in on Peacock because I was able to get a full year for $20. Now, once my renewal went, or my, my renewal was coming up and I was going to get the the newer price, which had gone up a month before my year subscription went, I was like, nope, don't watch Peacock enough. I mean, I didn't even watch Peacock. I think I watched enough Peacock in that year for 20 bucks worth of content. Um, never been really pleased with them. I never really enjoyed it all that much. Um, Pluto TV, which is free, is still more bang for your buck on that. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, you know, you have everybody, Hulu's raised their prices incredibly, Netflix too, then they're saying, you know, they're raising their prices now because they say, well, after the writers, the actor strike ends, you know, it's going to, imp- it's like, fuck you. No. So, I mean, if people start going, you know what, I'll just go back to cable and stop watching those shows that I keep watching on Netflix or, you know, Hulu or HBO Max, then, uh, things might start turning around. But again, it's not on the companies. It's really on us. Now, sometimes I roll around on YouTube long enough. You start, I start to see videos randomly about tiffs between online creators. Many of them are pretty hilarious, but it usually involves someone doing the bare minimum and getting a lot of views and a lot of monies in the process. SS Sniper Wolf and Jack Douglas are the latest to caught up to be caught up in a spat like this. Over a year, Jack has set his sights on SS Sniper Wolf for her reaction videos, or lack thereof. Jack's called her out on her reaction content, and he says he fails to meet the bar of fair use, and even made parody videos of her. Now lately he's targeted her for her lack of credit or links to the original creators on YouTube or TikTok videos she's reacting to. And I've seen some of her videos and she crops the video enough that because on TikTok videos, you know, it, it has the creator content on the side, but she crops the video enough that it's, you can't see the creator content, which sucks because it's like someone put the work and you're going to monetize off of them and you not even letting them get credit. But they've been going back and forth until two weeks ago when she showed up at his house and she parked in front of his home and posted a picture of his home on her Instagram story. She captioned it with, let's talk like adults. Now, Jack was live on Twitch on a Twitch stream when she posted it and someone on his stream informed him about it. He accused her of doxing him, which, you know, is dangerous in this day and age. Anytime somebody with a lot of followers says something and then people do it, it's it's pretty fucking scary now. Now, she tried to dismiss his accusations by, one, deleting the post, as one does, because no one can, God forbid, someone screenshots it. And two, she replied with this on his Twitter post. Quote, This creep has been harassing me for months, then plays victim, saying I threatened him when I just wanted to talk to him. I have no ill intentions. It's so sad when people have to constantly create drama to pay their bills. End quote. Over other YouTubers have jumped on Jack's def- to Jack's defense and asked YouTube to do something about it. Now, it's important to remember that SS Sniper Wolf has over 34 million subscribers, while Jack has around 5 million subscribers. She has more y- subscribers than he does, and this is YouTube. So you can see where I'm going with this. YouTube stayed quiet for over a week until they announced that they're punishing her with, quote, a temporary monetization suspension per creator responsibility policies, end quote. And then t- YouTube decided to go ahead and take a playbook, uh, uh, a line from a Trump speech in their tweet 
and criticize the behavior of both parties and express hopes that this incident would, quote, move the, this conversation to a better place or move this convo to a better place, excuse me, end quote. Suffice to say, no one is happy about their lack of attention, their lack of action, and the long silence. In the end, they blamed both parties, and SS Sniper Wolf tweeted out an apology. Jack Films, YouTube, and the entire creator community, and my incredible fans for not have not being a better example of conflict resolution. End quote. She since posted a handful of new videos on her YouTube account, which the comment section is disabled because you know that's how you accept criticism when you just disable your comments. Um, the bigger issue is. This just kind of keeps shining the light on the way YouTube runs their business. She has 34 million subscribers, produces a lot of content, gets a lot of, uh, a lot of revenue for Google, and they go ahead and just give her basically what a lot of people have said a slap on the wrist because this demonetization will probably only go for a little bit. And it's the same thing they did with Russell Brand. And, you know, instead of closing, you know, being accused of something, they just go ahead. Well, we're not we're going to demonetize his videos, which for some people, you know, it's their way of making money. But at the same time, you know, everybody's got a side hustle. You got a Patreon. You got, you know, all these other ones that you actually kind of promote so you can get more. You actually will take more money home than you would through Google. And this is just shining a a brighter spotlight on YouTube as how they treat people. Because if this happened with Jack and, you know, let's say Jack was the, the guy that went ahead and, and doxed some other person who had maybe a couple hundred thousand views, Jack would have been gone. They probably, they probably would for that, for that, for 5 million, they probably would have closed his channel and um, got rid of him. Now, if it was two people that barely had any views, those channels would have been gone immediately. There wouldn't have been no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But, you know, it's like they say, you know, you don't, uh, you don't kill your cash cow. And the last news story of the week. <laughs> File this under the, I'm sorry, what? Category? With the upcoming launch of the PlayStation 5 Slim, minus the optical drive, Sony is offering an add-on optical drive. While the rest of the story has some importance, it makes no sense to offer an external optical drive for a slim console. The slim console is designed to be digital only. If you need a, if you need a hard drive or an optical drive, just get a regular PS5. Now, the other problem that is, that is, is that if you get one of these Sony branded external hard drives, you will need to connect it to the internet upon installation. According to the Call of Duty news site, uh, Charlie Intel, which posted early pictures of the packaging on the new PS5 Slim bundle that includes a disk drive and a copy of the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. (laughs) Woohoo! That packaging includes some tiny disclaimer text notifying players that an, quote, Internet connection is required to pair disk drive and PS5 console upon setup, end quote. Some are suggesting that this pairing is an anti-piracy effort to ensure only authorized validated drives are connected to their hard drive. Ars Technica wrote, quote, preventing the connection of modified or generic drives that might aid in decrypting the data on those disks, for instance, end quote. This reminds me of the old... Xbox 360 launch version when they, you know, you had to buy everything piecemeal. Now, while everybody is kind of complaining about that, the bigger issue that I have is why the fuck would you be buying an optical drive for Slim? According to what I've, according to the prices, just buy a regular PS5. It would be cheaper. You're getting a discount for buying a, a, (laughs) pardon the phrase, diskless drive. Uh, PS5, but it's actually going to cost you more to buy that add-on drive than it would be to actually buy the fucking regular PS5. It makes no sense to me. Now, why I said it reminds me of a uh, of the early 360 launch, people need to remember that 
you know, gaming went back beyond, you know, 2010. Okay. When the original, so to give you a little bit of a backstory here, Nintendo Wii, the original Wii had just come out and was dominating the market. The PlayStation 2 and the X, the original Xbox were phasing out. Now, Sony was trying to push out the PlayStation 3. The problem is, is it kept running into a lot of technical issues, overheating, disk drives failing. A lot of, a lot of shit happened that prevented it from being released on time. It kept getting delayed. Microsoft, in an attempt to cash in on this, instead of, you know, putting everything together and pushing it out there, no, they decided to throw what they could out and everybody could just kind of almost in a sense mod their own Xbox 360. So you could buy the actual optical drive and the the console itself. And I think you get one controller or whatever. And it was out there. Oh, you wanted to you wanted to play and and this was still the time of the Blu-ray HD DVD uh war, if you want to call it that. And Microsoft decided to back HD DVDs while Sony was doing Blu-ray. And porn had opted to go Blu-ray. Now, <laughs> Microsoft decided, oh, you want to watch movies on that? It can do that, but you're going to need to buy an external HD DVD drive. Oh, you want a wireless too? You're going to have to buy the wireless adapter for that too. Oh, you want to do, you want to do this? Oh, well, you're going to have to buy. It basically became a complete add-on of shit so they just threw everything out there and hoped it would work and it didn't and then eventually the playstation 3 came out and it just crushed the market and then microsoft finally got their head out of their asses and decided to put here's the new i guess you could call it the slim xbox 360 which had everything in it already so it was like Come on, guys. So that's kind of what it seems like Sony's trying to do here. It's like, we, we we didn't really learn from that? I guess not. I don't know. Who am I to judge? I'm not a CEO of a company. Make too much fucking sense. All right. So my main topic this week, the Marvel problem. Social media fandom is funny to me. DC fans will bend over backwards to blame the studio for its failed cinematic universe. Now, don't get me wrong. The whole rollout was a complete clusterfuck right from the get-go. Now, if you don't believe me, go back and listen to the first episode of this podcast back in 2010, our very first show. The statements from Jeff Johns, or as Adam called him, Geoff Johns, was about why they weren't following the Marvel model. And it's ridiculous. It still makes me and Adam angry when we when we hear that. That's why we call him Geoff Johns. Yet, no one will understand why Marvel flopped with the release of Phase 4. So, you have so many online pundits that claim it was a state of woke decisions. And there was nothing in those movies that wasn't done in the comics. Plus... Many of these people who claim to be insiders never read a comic or knew how movies were made. If you don't believe me, you should read, you should go back in time and read some of the, uh, some of the news that was going around in 2016 after the, the flop of BVS. Yet they all jumped to write, record, or TikTok about how Marvel f- movies are failing. The reason Marvel and all the other Disney divisions and theme parks stumbled hard was due to one man, Bob Chapek. Now, he was the CEO of Disney after Bob Iger left the company in February of 2020. And in less than three years, Chapek was fired and replaced with Bob Iger. It's almost like an episode of Doctor Who. Now, it's fair to say that Chapek was dealt a pair of fuck you cards right from the beginning because less than two months into his tenure, the pandemic hit, which shuttered everything, films, television, resort business for the company not to mention a slew of content that was waiting to go into theaters. Now, much of the phase content in films and television fell at the feet of JPEG. Unlike Iger, who saw what worked and didn't fuck with it, JPEG was purely an administrative CEO. What I mean by this is that Iger liked to take success whatever way he could get it. Now, 
allowed the studios to make their own decisions and then release it when it was ready. Quality over quantity. Now, Chapek, on the other hand, wanted to steer the content on his whim. Iger wanted the studio heads to make to have more control and approach him when they needed to. JPEG believed that the studio knew more than the other studios did. Under JPEG, Disney announced their media and entertainment distribution division. Now, this was headed by his chief lackey, Kareem Daniels, which he gave ultimate power of distribution to them and not the studios. Basically meaning that division determined whether something was going to be made as a television movie, as a, as a film, or would be released on their streaming services. Or if they had a project, they would determine that it would go to streaming or it would go into theaters. There's going to be a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, after the rise of streaming services during the pandemic, Chapik believed that they could build their brand as, a, as the sake of killing the movie, the theater market, which was struggling. Most likely, he listened to all the talking heads on television and on social media. You know, the ones that, you know who they are, you know, the ones that said theaters are dead. The power of streaming, you know, through the pandemic is the final death blow that theater and theaters would start closing up. Obviously, that was before movies like Top Gun Maverick, Spider-Man No Way Home, The Batman, Barbie, and Oppenheimer proved them all wrong. Pixar took the brunt of the move to streaming. Luca and Soul were sent straight to streaming. Turning Red, which was originally slated to be a theatrical release, was a post-pandemic film that was designed to bring families back to the theater. But Chapek scuttled it and moved it straight to Disney+, Plus, where it virtually got lost despite positive reviews. Marvel was another that took a hit. Much of the content that was going to their mark, the mark, their way into theaters were scuttled and reworked into limited run television series. Kevin Feige was forced to meet the demands of the studio of throwing out so much content to meet the demands of the studio. This is where the Marvel fatigue came into play. And not because fans were tired of it, but much like Funko Pops, the market was oversaturated with content. While many fell victim to criticisms of lacks, lacking stories or underwhelming characters, Moon Knight, Ms. Marvel, Secret Invasion, and a few others seemed to rush the ending while building up the world. And in all honesty, it felt like I was reading a DC comic event series. You spend four issues building up the world and the stakes, only to throw it out the window in the final comic to end it. And while many regard Flashpoint as a great series, reread the series and tell me the fifth the fifth issue did not feel rushed. It felt completely rushed. Well, as I take a swig of my water right there. <clears throat> Much of what JPEG did is what Warner Brothers had been doing to DC for decades. Plus, remaking every cartoon into a live action version was bound to burn out. And if DC wants to be daring in that market, remake Song of the South and see where that takes you. While Star Wars started to see new life on streaming, regardless of what the trolls will have you think, Andor, The Mandalorian, and Ahsoka seem to have pleased the base, which didn't have any major movie releases to compete with. Now, while Marvel was forced to compete with itself with films like Thor Love and Thunder, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and the upcoming The Marvels, which is left over from the JPEG realm. And they're competing for eyes with streaming shows like Moon Knight, Loki, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, She-Hulk, Secret Invasion, Ms. Marvel, What If, WandaVision, and Hawkeye. <coughs> Remember the Comic-Con when the release of upcoming slates looked like a PowerPoint presentation? Well, things got so bad that the heads of the various studios teamed up with, let's just say, non-allies of JPEG and organized a mutiny. Disney knew it was sinking. They organized a coup to fire JPEG, who had just recently publicly renegotiated his contract for another few years, and to reinstall Bob Iger for two years to right the sinking ship. It wasn't 
all about the studios, though. There were quite a few PR issues with Chapek. The whole issue over the Florida don't say gay bill or lack of a response f- from Disney and Chapek, which eventually led to the whole DeSantis lawsuit. The negative campaign against Scarlett Johansson after Chapek's de- debacle over the Black Widow release. And that's just, you know, a couple. His ouster came at the worst public event. There was a Disney functioning happening at Dodger Stadium where Chapek was supposed to speak, but he never showed up. Many executives in attendance were confused about, by his absence. Suddenly, everyone's phone started blowing up with the announcement that Chapek had been fired, effective immediately, and Bob Iger was returning. In the end, Iger restored the function of the studios. Kareem Daniels and his whole division, that whole level of bureaucracy that was laid over the studio is basically, usually it was the studios and then Iger. And with with Chapek, it was the studios, Kareem Daniels and his whole division, and then Chapek. That was all gone. The whole thing was terminated and re, re, the studios regained their ability to own their own content. Iger allowed the studios like Marvel to cancel any projects that they didn't necessarily need or want, which was evident by the removal of countless series from their and movies from their upcoming Phase 5 and Phase 6 release window. Even by the recent move to shit can all the writers and directors for Daredevil Born Again to improve its quality. Much like DC, the issues plaguing content can be traced back to Bob Chapek. To me, it seems that the hate towards Kevin Feige is a lot like the hate towards James Gunn. It's strictly trolling, clickbait, TikTok content that people like to use to spike up engagement. It actually has nothing to do with the truth. Because as a recent study found out, fake news or misinformation spreads further online, thus increasing engagement faster than the actual truth. And the bigger question is, how long is this going? How long is it going to take Marvel, Pixar, and the others to come back with proper content, whether it be on streaming or in theaters? And before any of you jump down my throat, claiming, "Oh, here's a Marvel, you know, Dick Rider," <laughs> if you're a DC fan and you've done the mental gymnastics to explain why DC's failed, you're more, doing more Dick Riding than I am. But with that being said. I will be doing next week, my main topic will be the DC problem and talk about what the fuck happened there. So now we move on to the last item on my list, my douchebag of the week. Yes, I'm bringing back douchebags. I've I've always found douchebags to be fun. Uh, Always looking for the dumbest person of the week, which nowadays seems to be seems to be doing pretty good. (laughs) So my douchebag of the week, it's a political one. House Republicans. So my douchebag of the week had to go to the House Republicans. I mean, it had to. Over three weeks ago, Mac Gates, MAGA fire thrower and connoisseur of teenage girls, found voted to oust Speaker Kevin McCarthy because he worked across the aisle with Democrats to prevent a government shutdown. Because he worked with other people to prevent the government from shutting down. I want to make that make sure you, you it sinks in a little bit. Matt Gates voted to oust Kevin McCarthy because he worked with the opposing party to keep the government funded and running. Just wanted to make that clear. Eight Republicans broke with their party and McCarthy was ousted. And now here's a little inside baseball. McCarthy wanted to be speaker so much that he gave every one of those lunatics everything that they asked for, which included Gates wanting the ability to allow one person in the House to push for the removal of a speaker whenever they felt like it. And because he wanted it so bad, he gave it to him. And pundits at the time called McCarthy shrewd and, you know, oh, master negotiator, you know, to negotiate that deal that got him elected. Yeah, well, it took like 80 fucking votes, but he finally got what he wanted. No one at any moment thought this would come back to bite him in the ass until it did. Thus came the three-week search for a new speaker. 
Many threw their names into the ring and none of them made it anywhere, especially when Trump said no because he didn't like me enough. Even Trump's pick, Jim Jordan, failed three times to win the vote. Now, Speaker McCarthy, actually, let me, let me, let me back this up a little bit. Now, it turned into a colossal shit show on TV. Live TV. You had Republicans showing up on television using Democrats for the reason we couldn't have a speaker to, oh, this is what the, a real party of different ideas looks like. No. It was the majority of the party that stuck with a fucktard of the minority. No one had any backbone because they don't want to anger the fringe or make their leader upset and speak a bad about them on Truth Social. Now, former Speaker McCarthy settled in a, uh, on a threat and his counterparts slowly picked up the cue and went with it. He blamed Democrats for the reason that why he was gone. They couldn't have stepped in and saved McCarthy, but they sided with the minority within our party. Now, aside from the fact that Republicans can't do math, I know it's hard, but you are the majority party. Democrats aren't there to fix your shit. They do that every time they get control and they have to repair all the shit you did during your time in control. Now, my main point is bullshit. I'm sure for the sake of unity of the House of Representatives, every Republican would have sided with the Democrats if the Democrats were attempting to oust Nancy Pelosi. They would have put country before party and to keep her there. Fuck off. We know it's bullshit because they would have received death threats from the fringe and Trump would be all over true social claiming they support socialism. They managed to put in someone that no one knows anything about, believes that he was chosen by God to become the speaker, and once said, open the Bible and that's everything you need to know about me. Yikes. Now, I mean... Even the media that is on their fucking side was telling them to get their shit together. When you lose Fox and Newsmax, you're, you're in serious trouble. For a party that claims to be alphas and strongmen, they are a group of pussies. Real men accept responsibility and move on. Real men admit when they are wrong. Real men do what is right for something greater than themselves. Real men make their own decisions and not cower to whatever an orange orangutan says. As the man once said, if you have to say that you're something, means you're definitely are not. Basically, if you have to put on your Twitter profile that you're an alpha, means that you're nothing but a bitch. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what I'm doing, you have two ways to help out. One, you can make a one-time donation to make this show self-sustaining through either PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo. Check the show notes for details and links. Or two, you can share us on social media or review us on Apple Podcasts. This will make the algorithm gods promote our show onto an unsuspecting public. You can also stalk me on Facebook, facebook.com slash thelazygeeks4, Instagram, YouTube, Threads, or TikTok under at thelazygeeks, all one word. If you're old school, email me at thelazygeeksnetwork at gmail.com. And want to read some news, blogs, or just some of my random musings? Check out the blog at thelazygeeks4.wordpress.com. So that's it for me this week. So until next time, I'm Stephen Vargas. Remember, we're thinking so you don't have to.